So hi everyone, and welcome to another of Ian's interviews. We have a special guest today to talk about Wi-Fi, and in particular, Wi-Fi 7. What's your minimum specification? Now what's Wi-Fi 7, you might ask? We've just got Wi-Fi 6. I've literally just installed Wi-Fi 6 in my home. Why are we talking about Wi-Fi 7? Isn't that far away? Isn't it for the enterprise? Well, it's almost here. And today I'm with James Chen, VP of Wireless Solutions here at MediaTek, because they're one of the first companies, or one of the first company, with a full Wi-Fi 7 solution. So hi, James. Welcome to the channel. Oh, hi, Ian. Thanks for having us. Glad to be here. So let, let, let's get down with the biggest question. We're here today to talk about Wi-Fi 7. We're actually here at your MediaTek Analyst Day, and Wi-Fi 7 is one of the big topics we're talking about. Most of us have just installed Wi-Fi 6 and Wi-Fi 6E in our homes. That's right. Businesses are still playing with Wi-Fi 5 and Wi-Fi 6. Why do we have such a fast follow-on for Wi-Fi 7? Well, Ian, that's a very good question. I think uh, you know I'll, I'll attempt to answer that in two parts. I think one is uh, it's an industry thing. I think uh, for the first time, Wi-Fi as an industry is kind of quickening its pace uh, to adopt and develop new technology. So whereas before, between successive Wi-Fi generations, it was maybe a gap of five or six years. Now within a span of four years, you actually have Wi-Fi 6, Wi-Fi 6E, and now, as you say it, uh, Wi-Fi 7. So that's, that's the first thing. I think it's just a new cadence of the industry. But second of all, we think really it's a sign of the times. You know, if you look at it, we're truly on present territory. We have something called hybrid work model and uh, where people spend a lot more time at home and therefore more demanding of their Wi-Fi network because let's just face it, everybody's using Wi-Fi more and more. So it's a very interesting point in time where, you know, you have this perfect combination of the industry quickening its pace and also really a new paradigm setting in where you use wireless more and more. So it sets up the stage for Wi-Fi 7 really to shine, in our opinion. So o over the years, you know, I've, I've been through the Wi-Fi 5 transition, the Wi-Fi 6 transition, and I remember all that sort of pre-ready Wi-Fi standard equipment was a lot, was a quite higgledy-piggledy. Uh, so is there anything in Wi-Fi 7 that means that some of these, op there's not as many optional features and we all get a good base this time around? Well, I, I, we certainly hope so. Um, I think Wi-Fi 7, for the first time, really has something new to shout about, to use a non-technical term. So it's not just about speed this time? No, definitely not. And of, of course, speed is one of the important things because speed definitely gets people's attention. It's a bigger number of box. And let's face it, we all like more speed. But it's also about reduced latency. It's all uh, about you know an, a more reliable, always-on network. Uh, so there's a lot of new technologies that we'll get into later on today, but that's really truly sets Wi-Fi 7 apart from some of the earlier generation technologies. So at this event, or at, as the event and into the next few weeks, you're announcing your first full solution, the PhiLogic 380 for end devices and 880 for access points, uh, built on 6 nanometer, whole host of new standards, support for 2.4 gigahertz, 5 gigahertz, and six gigahertz, and with the uh, the 380, the end user solution, two by two antenna going into end devices. Typically, we see demand for Wi-Fi on end user devices like you know this laptop and smartphones. So, are you ready to put it in smartphones straight away? Well, I think uh, you brought up a good point. First of all, it's important to have as a wi leading Wi-Fi chipset technology supplier. First of all, it's important to have both sides of the link, the solution for it, because that's how you make the whole network, the whole user experience better. So that's one. So that's why we have PhiLogic 380 on the end clients, and therefore reciprocally PhiLogic 880 on the access point or the router side. So that's number one. You got to have that to be truly considered a uh, lean tech. Um, but to answer your question, yes, I mean, uh, different market segments will adopt these solutions at different pace and time points. Um, but it is coming up, and um, it, you know, history is uh, you know any you know judge of uh, you know, the future events. So usually, what happens is the consumer electronics industry usually adopts the end devices, the client solutions, a little bit faster, 
than the infrastructure guys. Um, and we expect no different uh, this time around. It seems very chicken and egg sometimes. It is. And you wonder which one's the chicken and which one's the <laughs> egg. Um, but no, but you need both the chicken and the egg or else yeah. there's just no meal. Um, but uh, so that's why you need both ends of the th uh, of the uh, technology on both ends to really bring forward all the goodies that Wi-Fi 7 can truly help. So I, I can just envision some people shouting at the screen now because the Wi-Fi 7 standards aren't expected to be finalized until the end of next year, right? The end of 2024 or the end of 2023 into 2024. So how can MediaTek come along to today and say, we've got silicon that will support the standard? Very good question. And I think, uh, well, I hope your, your uh, viewers are not shouting too loudly at the screen because we have a really good answer. But first of all, it is true by the end of next year is when you can potentially, potentially caveat, uh, start getting the logo uh, for the, the product. Right. But really the technology will be finalized uh, way before that. Right. So that's number one. But number two is the fact that MediaTek, we've been involved in not just Wi-Fi 7, but all the previous generation of Wi-Fi for such a long time. This is not our first time around. So we know how to design chips so that it will be when by the time it comes out in, in products, be able to be, you know, uh, compatible and support all the latest and greatest Wi-Fi 7 features. So the devices that will have these chips in coming towards the end of the year, they're currently, your partners are playing with them now, playing, mm -hmm. <laughs> designing products around them. They'll be able to be called Wi-Fi 7, but they won't have the specific logo. Um, Is that how it works? I think if you look at uh, what's done in the past, you know, certain people, certain companies have gotten very creative with the name. Yep. So uh, they can't call it the official version until, you know, the official, you know, certification comes out. So they'll, they'll come up with another term for it. But the underlying thing, and this is an important point, the underlying technology is, you know, based upon, you know, uh, IEEE standard 802.11be, which is uh, the technical name for the standard. So, yeah, what we would have called AC or AX. That's right. This one would be BE. Right, right. I personally, I still kind of prefer, you know, those kind of more old school IEEE names. But I get it. Uh, for the mass public, yes, we have to have a, 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 a numerological a numerology, if you will, system for each of the successive standards. So onto your access point silicon, this Phylogic 880. Um, the specifications you're putting out for it are really decent. It's a 4x4 four four solution with uh, 4 transmit, 5 receive uh, for some of those extra features mm -hmm. that you're adding to Wi-Fi 7. Uh, 19 gigabits per second uh, throughput, uh, added, uh, added processing power six nanometer and what i'm interested in really is the fact that you've also got two 10 gig <laughs> surdies ethernet on there typically with new standards the money's in going for the enterprise straight away because they're willing to adopt the technology first um so where exactly is this product pos is this product positioned for oh, okay well i would say at a very broad level or high level I think what Wi-Fi 7 truly brings to the game that's new is the concept that you can actually use Wi-Fi to replace any wireline technology in the home or small medium business. That's the newness part. And so therefore, with any wireless technology, as you know, over distance, the speed typically, you know, gradually rolls off over distance. So you need to start at a pretty high number so that by the end of its range, it's still at a pretty high number. Um, so. I think that's just, that's just a high level way to look at it. Why 19 gigabits per second? Well, you know, that's the speed, the highest speed for a tri-band 4x4, you know, 2.4, 5, and 6 gigahertz. And when MediaTek set out to design such a system, a platform, you would say, we also balanced it with two 10 gigabit Ethernet because the Wi-Fi, the wireless, and the wired have to be in balance of each other, right? What's coming in is what's coming out and vice versa. You can't have that imbalance. Um, so it may seem like, wow, wider speeds are so high. But if you look at it from that context, it's perfectly like a yin and yang, right? So yeah. it's perfectly balanced. And in addition to that, this platform, we've also upgraded the networking capability. So the network processing unit, the MPU, as well as the CPU, they all have been respectively upgraded to kind of match the increased 20 gigabit per second throughput that we want to uh, shuttle through this thing. 
Yeah, I, I think you've said the networking processing unit. It's got like four ARM Cortex A72 or 73 series cores, uh, increased you know, IPsec processing, all those features. It sounds kind of enterprisey. Yeah, it sounds uh, enterprising now, which is a good thing because these products probably won't be on the market until 23 or 24. So if it doesn't sound high end now, something probably isn't quite kosher because by the time, you know, the pace of technology moves so fast, as we all know, by the time we get there, you know, we're hoping that the, 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 uh, it's, it's right sized, uh, hopefully by the time it gets there. One of the things, one of the features of Wi-Fi 7 that I think you're going to be shouting from the rooftops and probably all your competitors will be as well, mm. is this multi-link operation. Mm. What we in the carrier industry would call carrier aggregation. Yeah. The ability to have multiple megahertz channels across, or in this case, across 2.4, 5, and 6, and essentially use them as one. Have the combined speed, range, and capability of them all. Now, we've seen this in the mobile industry for over a decade. We're now up to, what, eight levels of carrier aggregation, depending on where you are, millimeter to wave, sub six. So why has it taken so long for that technology to come to what is essentially home standard Wi-Fi connectivity? Uh, I, I think it's a great question. I think uh, one of the potential reasons is that I think Wi-Fi has been I think really blessed with a lot of spectrum, uh, unlicensed spectrum. Uh, so if you look at history, right, we had 2.4 uh, gigahertz in the United States. That's about 83 and a half megahertz wide. When it came out, that was considered a lot. So we kind of said, oh, that's good enough. And then five gigahertz came around and that offered over 500 megahertz of unlicensed spectrum. We said, wow, that's enough too. So there really was no need to aggregate. And then lo and behold, two years ago, we have 6 gigahertz, where in the United States, it's 1.2 gigahertz, or in Europe, slightly under 500 megahertz. So we had the you know, Wi-Fi industry, we had the good fortune of having these large swaths of unlicensed spectrum. And so that provided a lot of speed already as is, versus the cellular world, as you know, they're getting bits and pieces because they have to pay for them. So therefore, they had more impetus to aggregate them to increase the bandwidth. So I think Wi-Fi has come to a junction where we have said, okay, well, let's do that as well to get even higher speed. So I think that's probably the mo most plausible, uh, I, I guess, uh, a reason why. So th does, does mul this multi-link operation carry, I I'm g swear I'm going to keep calling it carry aggregation just because that's okay. what's so familiar to me. Does it help with interference? Uh, I mean, we're currently in a hotel and there are a lot of Wi-Fi devices yes. around. And you know, I've lived in flats and you can easily pick off 20, 30, 40 Wi-Fi right. devices across all the channels of 2.4 and 5 especially. Does multi-link operation help in that regard? Absolutely. In fact, this is one of the most interesting aspects of MLO or carrier aggregation for Wi-Fi is that it not only aggregates, like you say, different bands together for more bandwidth and speed, but also has some other very unique uh, properties, right? Like you say. So one is robustness. If uh, you're aggregating, let's say, 2.4 and 6 gigahertz together at the same time, and like you say, your neighbor and your neighbor's neighbor and your neighbor's neighbor's neighbor <laughs> is also on 2.4, well, MLO kind of gracefully, you know, kind of you know, kind of, you know, still has a, another data path through 6 gigahertz without the client reassociating to every time to a different SSID and new spectrum. The other benefit is that with MLO, there are certain features built in where that it's um, also the benefit is lower latency. And, um, you know, I, I, you know, we're going to be publishing a white paper uh, toward the end of this month that will go into all the bits and bytes and how uh, this all works. But it's a trifecta. You know, it's speed, it's lower latency, it's more reliable, always on connection. So for the first time ever, a technology can, you know, take the triple crown, if you will. Um, so that's why it's so exciting. That's why we're all excited about it. So say I have a Wi-Fi 6 device, you know, kind of like this laptop here in front of me, and I connect to a Wi-Fi 7 access point. Do I get any benefit? Um, I would say not per se from a standards point of view. Uh, but, if we're, but if you were to connect to a MediaTek PhiLogic 880 access point, for example, if you're on Wi-Fi 6E, um, you know, obviously you're not on Wi-Fi 7, so you don't get MLO. You don't get some of the, like, you know, 320 megahertz wide uh, channel bandwidth. But 
what you do get is that some of the um, proprietary goodies that we baked into our chipset, that's agnostic to whatever Wi-Fi there is. For example, in our Phylogic A80 on 6 gigahertz, we have uh, five antennas to receive. So therefore, we extend the range. And that's completely Wi-Fi standard agnostic. That's just, you know, having more receive diversity, using more MRC, uh, more receive gain, right, that way. Yeah, it, it was look interesting looking at the specifications, and you have this uh, four transceiver, five receiver that's config. Right. That's right. And so that's the reason. That's the reason, because we, and we did that especially for one of the three bands, which is a six gigahertz, yeah. which as you know, Ian, as you get higher and higher in frequency, physics says, you know, you have more and more path loss and you roll off faster. So to counteract some of that, you know, you can't counteract all of it. To counteract some of that, provide more range for the end user, we have that fifth chain for receive. Often with new technology adoption, right? It's we're here today talking about the silicon. It's with partners they're developing products to come out at the end of the year. But right now, we're we've we've essentially got a glut of Wi-Fi six devices, access points, and six E coming through. I installed a Wi-Fi six access point in my in-laws' place for about fifty bucks. At just a simple two by two, four ports, gigabit Ethernet. It's really come down in price. Mm -hmm. And it really helped their you know, Wi-Fi signal through, through their flat. With Wi-Fi 7 being so far out from you know, standards um, and silicon coming today through to the end of the year next year, when should we really see that sort of crossover point where Wi-Fi 7 becomes cost effective? Um, I think it's a good question, probably a little too soon to prognosticate. Um, but usually, you know, we, we have a lot of history to look at, right? Because we started with Wi-Fi 1, where back then it was just 802.11b. Um, but if you look at history, and if passes any prologue, we would say that typically about three years or so, um, at least that was true for the last generation, you see you know, new device shipments of that technology, of the latest technology crossing over the nine-digit realm in the billions, right? So I think when that happens, Interesting market dynamics take over as a you know high level kind of thing, but I would say um, it's a little bit too early to tell. Uh, one interesting thing is that since Wi-Fi Seven brings so much new capabilities to the game, um, there may be I, I would say new usage cases that will evolve. Where you know you don't have an Apple to Apple comparison between Wi-Fi Seven and the previous standard. It just there's no basis for a comparison. So it'd be very interesting to see how and device makers kind of price that unique benefit in. Well, if you've got hundreds of billions of chips, <laughs> you know, if that's the plan, uh, is the silicon shortage going to affect that? Um, you know, we are living in very interesting times, right? And, uh, you know, we can't really prognosticate what's going to happen. But I would say that our because our Wi-Fi solutions on both the client end, the 380 and the 880, are designed in 6 nanometer um, and not older process nodes, I think that goes a long way to kind of mitigate. In fact, that was one of our goals is that we select a process node where we know in the future projecting forward, uh, you know, there will be probably less issues with supply going forward. Oh, so that sounds good. Um, go, does that go, make you feel better? Yeah, yes, yes, it does. Can all breathe a sigh of relief? Because <laughs> I'm just thinking, we, I mean, we, we've tracked um, all the big foundries with their like legacy process nodes, which is typical for RF, whether that's 14, 28, 40 nanometer, they're all seeing record revenues and record demand. So you, you're, you've kind of got this middle, somewhere between leading edge logic and legacy legacy nodes, mm -hmm. and you expect the volume to be there. That sounds good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that's one of the challenges of being in the chip business, is, which is, as you know, you know, it's, uh, it's a challenging business because you're essentially, by the time you put, you know, pencil to paper, and by the time you start from there and count for when chips actually roll off the assembly line, so to speak, it's multiple years. So essentially, you're kind of forecasting multiple years into the future. So you've got to have that experience, that insight to kind of pick a process known in this, uh, these very challenging times and mitigate all those supply issues. The three-year comment that you said between this crossover, I, I, given that Wi-Fi 7 is kind of, it feels like a fast follow-on from Wi-Fi 6. And for those of my audience more akin to the PC, we've seen, you know, sort of PCIe 3, 4, 5, that's kind of accelerating as well. Uh, DDR4, DDR5, 
you know, future DDR6, maybe that's accelerating as well. So give it three years. Are we going to be talking Wi-Fi 8? Um, you know, I think from a pure technologist point of view, you know, my point of view, I think I hope so. Um, or else what else would we be talking about? <laughs> but Okay, but, fair, fair, fair. <laughs> but, but no, but in all seriousness, I, I think the Wi-Fi industry, uh, both IEEE and, and the industry body groups, I think they're all looking at, you know, uh, probably a quickened pace uh, somewhere around that time. And um, uh, so you can get all the companies to agree to a quick and pace. Well, I, you know, I, I think it's uh, always a challenge. And uh, but, you know, that's the whole idea of having industry groups is to talk about these things. But but there is uh, that that is the quick and pace um, in everybody's seeing it. I think we're seeing it for the first time. That's why, you know, between 2019 and 2023, there were three standards. But I think hopefully after this, you know, probably be a, a, hopefully a more um, acceptable cadence that uh, people you know can get used to so I, I know we've already spoken about the 10 gigabit ethernet ports on on your access point silicon before and i know a bunch of my audience are interested in keeping that sort of high-end networking in the home mm -hmm. but we're having issues with the vendors who implement silicon charging very top-end premiums for say 10 gig ethernet mm. um, you know limiting it to their enterprise line yeah. Or just not implementing it at all. You know, can you foresee adoption of things like 10 gig Ethernet? Because you obviously oh. need it for the Wi-Fi. Right, right. In the uh, end. I think there is a couple of points of view on this. One is that uh, we do have gigabit Ethernet on there, like you say, two 10 gigabit Ethernet ports, but they're extremely configurable. So you can take, for example, one 10 gigabit Ethernet port, attach a switch on there, and split out to four two and a half gigabit Ethernet ports. <laughs> Right, so that will will kind of take the edge off. For example, um, you don't have to implement all twenty gig. <laughs> uh, the other more interesting thing is uh, why have wired gigabit Ethernet ports at all? Um, you know, if you look at Wi-Fi Seven, we're coming into a realm where all these fantastic uh, maximum speed numbers are are being defined and being implemented. Is this really the time and the generation of Wi-Fi where we move, move to truly wireless backhaul? and not even have gigabit Ethernet. So therefore, you can avoid that kind of conversation altogether if you want. Uh, no, so, 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 so this is where we have to disagree. I appreciate you're in the wireless business. You have to plug uh, your stuff. I, I expect there'll be a, a, a lot of our audience who, regardless of how good Wi-Fi gets, like even with Wi-Fi mice, they won't use them for gaming because of a latency or a perceived latency or maybe the fact that the latency is so good anyways right. they 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 don't want to believe it's as good as wired sure. right can you ever overcome that way of thinking well um we won't overcome it overnight <laughs> I, I think the different strokes for different folks uh yes there will also always be some portion of the user base who like wider ethernet but imagine this if you will just Indulge me for a minute. Um, at, right now, you know, uh, one of the things that's hot in the networking world, at least in the home, and even SMB is, uh, you know, these repeaters where they have all sorts of names, extenders and mesh nodes. And right now, the connection between these extenders and mesh nodes between each other and the main gateway can either be wired or using Wi-Fi. Um, one possible scenario is that with Wi-Fi 7, this backhaul, this connection between all these nodes are so good now that there could be an inflection point where you say, well, I really don't need the wire. That's what I was saying. Now, of course, people will still want to probably maybe plug in a wire to their desktop to enjoy that Uber gaming <laughs> experience. But that's a different application. I'll give you right, that. Okay. Here I'm talking about using wireless purely as a backhaul to extend the range and have that nice video quality when you like do a, when people are watching this video, for example, at <laughs> home in wondrous, you know, 4K, whatever, and have no lag and beautiful latency and crystal clear fidelity. And that's all through a wireless backhaul. And there's multiple devices doing that. So I think the day when that comes is, is we believe is at hand, uh, we truly for the first time with Wi-Fi 7. It's actually good that you brought that, brought that because in the specifications, for the chipsets you're announcing, I did see something called uh, so something that builds on the these extenders, these expanders, these mesh. Because those devices rely on having either multiple radios on diff on the same frequency, 
or splitting the back hall and the front and the front hall equivalent to different frequencies. But with Wi-Fi 7, you don't have that situation. Um, actually, you, you can have that situation. And actually, it, Wi-Fi 7 lends itself uh, to that situation even, even better. Uh, for example, um, our Phylogic 880 has tri-band 4x4, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. so three 4x4 radios, one at each frequency. But you can also scale up to five bands, pentaband. So we can use add two more bands, each 4x4, one at 5 and one at 6 gigahertz. And that can be the wireless backhaul between uh, okay. all the different mesh nodes we talked about. So we really have a dedicated backhaul that's free from all the noise and chatter of all these you know, million, lots of devices in your home speaking at different times and uh, different intervals. Um, so this dedicated backhaul really becomes a wireless backbone. And the other interesting thing is now you add an MLO and all of a sudden you use carrier aggregation to borrow your term, yep. where now you can aggregate on the backhaul five and six gigahertz together to, to form a really robust backhaul because in near and medium ranges, you have both frequencies. But as you, you know, go further and further away, the distance between the mesh nodes and the gateway gets further and further, the six gigahertz will gracefully, you know, go down faster, but you still have the five. And I think this is really, you know, um, you know really a uh, really important time point where, you know, people are gonna see that for the very first time. So being a European, I have a bone to pick with you because a lot of uh, Wi-Fi companies focus, put their, all their focus into the US. And you know, in Europe, our houses are made out of bricks. In the US, it's kind of everything from paper all the way up. So our Wi-Fi signals don't travel. Is there anything in Wi-Fi 7 that helps deal with that? Well, yes. I mean, uh, Ian, that's a very good question. I mean, uh, Mediatek, we have customers also in Europe as well, including Just England. one or two. <laughs> yes. Um, and yeah, that is a very serious problem. And I think Wi-Fi 7 with MLO really helps. I think it comes to the rescue because in European nations and the United Kingdom, your transmit output power at 6 gigahertz is really not that great. But now you have MLO to kind of combine it, carry it aggregated with a 5 gigahertz signal where the transmit power level is, you know, so much higher. So I think it will help at the end of the day. It's actually, I, I didn't realize that the transmit power on six gig was low for Europe. Mm -hmm. That might be why we're seeing fewer 6E devices. Yes. But we're getting plenty of Wi-Fi 6 devices. That's right. That, that makes That's a lot right. of sense. So with, 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 with the announcement you're making, it's the world's first uh, combined Wi-Fi solution. And back at CES, you had the world's first Wi-Fi 7 public demo. Um, but then you've also got competitors saying that they've got the world's first Wi-Fi 7 solution. And they actually announced that a couple of weeks ago. With all this toing and froing and you know exactly yes. what you're announcing as world's first, is there any benefit or point to it? Yeah, it gets a little bit dizzy after a while, right? Your head's spinning probably. I can see your head spinning right now. No, but but really, we want to emphasize one thing, which is when we announce Wi-Fi 7, it's part of a larger platform play. We're not, we're not just announcing a new Wi-Fi chip. No, where it's the chip is in a much bigger system that we've optimized. For example, Phylogic 380 can be found in our Dimensity smartphones that we've optimized for that. It can be found in our TV solutions, our set-top box solutions, all of which we, we have our, the complete solution. Even the Phylogic 880 is a complete platform. So we believe that really distinguishes us from you know all of our other competitors who are really just announcing chips. When it comes to your customers, partners, however you want to call them, they obviously buy the chips, go away, design their devices, whether that's you know a Dimensity plus a Phylogic, and you know maybe they get a discount for buying both at the same time. To what extent do you go with those chips to your partners, to your customers, and help them optimize their solutions? Well, first of all, we try to optimize it before we give it to them, right? Like I said earlier. But certainly, to your point, yes, uh, we are absolutely fanatical about that and our support. We've been doing this for a long time. Uh, this is coming up on MediaTek's 25th year of existence. So we know a thing or two about, you know, how to satisfy our customers and give them really good support. But yes, with any new technology, the complexity is there and we try to help as much as we can. Do you find that there are certain partners eager to be the lead partner? 
with stuff like this? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, sure. I mean, uh, we have alpha partners. I think that's what we're saying. Yes, absolutely. And uh, those tend to want to the latest and greatest from MediaTek. And yes, we have, uh, you know, uh, quite a few of those relationships. Yes. Are there any that are being part of this announcement? I didn't see any in the press release. Um, not uh, not uh, this time, but hopefully, you know, in the near future. Yes, as we go toward the rest of the year. It's uh, with the silicon now. Uh, they're getting hands on optimized for products end of the year. Um, I would say uh, there will be some people who will come out with pre Wi-Fi seven. Uh, whether that's uh, you know end of this year, beginning of next year, middle of next year, it kind of runs the gamut. It really depends on uh, you know what their overall strategy is. But we'll be there to support them. So wrapping it all back to the beginning. When we were talking about the fast follow-on Wi-Fi six, Wi-Fi five to Wi-Fi six to Wi-Fi seven, and then perhaps to Wi-Fi eight a few years down the line, what exactly does the roadmap look like? Well, uh, that's an excellent question, and uh, I think if we kind of peer into our crystal ball a little bit, I think uh, a few things kind of stand out. One is, uh, I think, in the future, this distinction between a gateway, you know, on the infrastructure side, between a gateway and the mesh node will probably start to blur a little bit um, because there is a concept where your phone, your laptop or your desktop, whatever your end device can be, you know, sent data by more than one of these uh, access points or mesh nodes at the same time for improved coverage and performance. That's one. I think number two, as you've seen it with carrier aggregation or MLO, uh, there are a lot of technologies that are kind of you know, cross pollinating, if you will, uh, uh, between the cellular world and Wi Fi. So, therefore, um, any tricks of the trade that you know of how to design really great cellular chips will really help you in Wi Fi. And we don't have time today to go through it, but that's certainly something that we have been privileged to be a part of because we've been doing cellular for quite some time. And I think, thirdly, um, you'll see probably things uh, from Wi Fi that have to do less and less with pure raw speed. Speed does matter. It does sell. It's the you know, quickest thing to articulate and easiest thing to understand. My mother will understand that. Um, but, you know, things with reducing latency, better QoS, um, more reliability, I think those will get more and more play as we go forward. That sounds great. Thanks, James, and good luck. Thank you, Ian. Thanks a lot. If you like this content, please don't forget to like and subscribe. We also have now a private Discord server. And if you want access to that, become a Patreon member and it'll instantly add you as long as your emails are linked. You can join the Patreon for as little as $1.50 a month and it all goes back into helping the channel. Thank you for your support.